present to you a man that I think is absolutely brilliant. He's all over social media doing his interviews regarding mental health and the connection to the mind and body with disease, addictions, and stress, and all kinds of things. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Gaber Mate. So I'm a retired doctor now. I don't work as a doctor anymore. I did work for 20 years in family practice. Seven years I was coordinator of the palliative care unit looking after terminally ill people in Vancouver Hospital. And for 12 years I worked in Vancouver's downtown east side looking after people with severe addictions um, to cocaine, to crystal meth, to, to opiates like heroin, uh, to uh, alcohol, of course people dying of HIV, of hepatitis C, and every other disease caused by addictions. And in my practice, I looked after young families, I looked after people of all ages, and I'll tell you what I've learned. The one thing I've learned, I've learned many things, but the one thing that I can reduce it to or simplify it to is that virtually everything I ever saw, where there was cancer, where there was multiple sclerosis, where there was depression, whether it was addiction, whether it was ADHD, whether it was colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know what it came down to? It came down to what happens in people's childhoods. In other words, the major contributor, I don't say the only, but the major contributing factor to the onset of illness, whether it's mental illness, physical illness, whether it's addiction, whether it's behavior problems, it what happens to people in the first few years of life. And that may seem like an astonishing statement, and how is this guy going to prove it in the 16 minutes that he's got left? Well, let's give it a try. In the downtown east side, which is Vancouver's drug area, and not only is it Vancouver's drug area, it's also known as North America's most concentrated area of drug use. We have more people there using <coughs> Uh, injecting substances than any other place in North America in a few square block radius. I can tell you that over a 12 year period I didn't meet a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child, not a single male patient who had not been either physically abused or sexually abused or neglected or abandoned in significant ways. And. In North America, we like to think of addiction as either a choice that people make, and if they make that choice, then we punish them for it, so we build jails where we keep people who use drugs. Or we see it as a brain disease that's genetically inherited. So if we look at the, the sad fact that in Canada, 30% of the people in our jails are First Nations origin, where they only make up 4 to 5 percent of the population. We explain that by saying that these, these poor people genetically are susceptible to addiction. So it's either we make it into a disease or we make it into a choice. Neither is true. It's not a choice. Nobody ever chooses to be an addict, nor is it something that's inherited. We know, for example, that even people that do inherit some genes that are predisposed to addictions, if they're brought up in proper environments, they have no more risk of addiction than anybody else. So it's not ever the genes that cause the addictions, and nobody ever chooses the addiction. What actually happens is, when people are traumatized, that increases their risk of addiction. And if you want to know why the First Nations population in this country, it's because they're the most traumatized segment in the Canadian population. Historically, I don't suppose I have to tell you about that, but the fact that in the Prairie Provinces, I'm not sure what the percentage are in Alberta, but I know in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, I know the percentage is high, I don't know how high it is in, in, in Alberta, but most of the kids in care are First Nations origin. This is in a population that knew how to look after their kids beautifully, that if you look at the parenting practices of First Nations people across the world, they're actually superior to 
those of industrial societies, according to all the research, unless they're traumatized, in which case the trauma is passed on from one generation to the next. So when it comes to addiction then, what we're looking at is the impact of childhood trauma. Why? Because number one, if you, let's just define an addiction. An addiction is any behavior, substance related or not, that an individual pursues because they find pleasure, relief, or um, they crave it temporarily, so they pursue it for the pleasure and the relief, despite negative consequences, and they don't give it up in the face of negative consequences. I said any behavior, so that could be sex, gambling, eating, shopping, work, relationships, or substances. And if you ask yourself, by that definition, have you ever had an addictive pattern in your life? If you're like most of the people I speak with, if I ask that question, many of you would put your hand up. By that definition, if you've ever had an addictive behavior. And then if you ask yourself, but what did that behavior give me? What did I like about it? Well, you'll tell yourself, it relieves stress. So when I am very stressed, I go home and I eat a lot. Or uh, then I turn on the TV and I just veg out. Um, or I do drugs. Or I go shopping and I spend a lot of money I, don't, I can't afford to spend. So, in other, in other words, the addiction serves a purpose, it temporarily relieves stress. Or it distracts you from emotional pain that you're experiencing. Or it gives you pleasure that otherwise is not available to you. What I'm saying to you is that the addiction is never the primary problem. The addiction is always an attempt on the individual's part to solve a problem. The problem is why I'm having so much emotional pain and how come I don't know how to deal with emotional pain? Why is there so much stress in my life and how is it that I can't regulate my stresses without an addictive expression? Why am I lacking pleasure? If you're feeling shy and isolated and it takes a few drinks to loosen your tongue, what happened to you? that you feel so scared of people. In other words, the addiction is not the problem, the addiction is actually an attempt at a solution. The problem arose because early in childhood you were somehow hurt. Because when people are traumatized, a number of things happen. One is they begin to feel themselves as deficient because children are narcissistic. And I don't mean that in the sense of any pejorative uh, implication. What I mean by that is they think it's all about them. <clears throat> they think everything is about themselves. So when good things happen to a child, the child will assume, hey, I must be great because look at all these great things that are happening. But if bad things happen to a child, if the child is yelled at, or beaten, or sexually abused, or told to go to their room when their parents don't like their behavior, or the parents are just depressed or unhappy or stressed, traumatized in their own life, the child thinks these bad things are happening because I'm a bad person. So then you have low self-esteem. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is that what we now know, and this is a conference on the brain, what we now know is that the circuits of the brain are actually shaped by early experiences, so that the brain isn't just genetically determined, that already in the uterus, what's happening to the mother is already affecting the brain circuitry of the child. So when the mother is stressed, that's affecting the baby's brain. And these people that are traumatized in childhood, they don't have the conditions for healthy brain development. And then they're going to have mental health problems. And they're going to have ways of, of, of compensating for those mental health problems through addictive behaviors. So whether we're looking at the low self-esteem, whether we're looking at the brain physiology, whether we're looking at the spiritual isolation of how alone the addict feels that it all goes back to what happened early in childhood. It's just a compensation. It's not a healthy compensation. It creates more problems. But where did it begin? It began with suffering of the young child. Now, as I said, everything I've seen, whether it was cancer, multiple sclerosis, or mental illness, or addiction, begins with childhood issues. Well, how can cancer begin with childhood issues, you ask yourself? A Canadian study showed that when children are abused, 
when they grow up to be adults, the risk of cancer goes up nearly 50%. Why? Because the abuse or the trauma creates coping mechanisms. Now, one of the ways that we cope when children are traumatized, one of the ways they, they cope with it is to soothe themselves, and then that's where addictions come in. But another way to cope would be is if you get the message that you're not good enough, that you are not worthy enough, then you might spend the rest of your life trying to prove that you are. And how do you do that? By being very nice to everybody. By never saying how you feel, because they might not like how you feel. By never expressing healthy anger when somebody's crossing your boundaries. By working too hard to prove that you're worthwhile. That's why I was a workaholic doctor, because I got the message as an infant as a Jewish infant under the Nazis in the Second World War. I got the message that the world didn't want me, I wasn't good enough. Well, then you spend the rest of your life compensating by taking on too much, and you're stressing yourself. And those stresses have an impact on your physiology. They have an impact on your immune system. They have an impact on your cardiovascular system, on your heart, on your nervous system. They can cause disease. So most diseases that most of my colleagues, the physicians, think they're just random, arbitrary diseases, they're not random or arbitrary at all. They're the result of life-strong stresses that result from a child's attempt to compensate. So typically, people with autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or colitis or Crohn's disease, or, for that matter, cancer. If you look at their lives, what you notice about them is they've had great difficulty expressing their emotions because in childhood they were forbidden from doing so. So they compensated by suppressing their feelings. And they have great difficulty saying no, so that when people ask them to do things, they automatically will say yes, and they'll keep doing things even though they're very stressed by it. And then you end up with the body saying no, because they didn't, in the form of illness. I know this is, I'm not telling you proof because this too, my time with you tonight is too short, but what I do, can tell you that is absolutely scientifically unquestionable is that you cannot separate the mind from the body. So whatever happens emotionally will actually have an impact on your physiology because the brain systems that regulate emotions are part and parcel of the same system that the immune system is a part of, the cardiovascular system is a part of, the nervous system is a part of, and the hormonal apparatus is all part of it as well. So whatever happens emotionally also immediately has an impact physiologically. And that's why you can't separate people's emotional lives from their physiology. You can also not separate people's physiology from their relationships. We know, for example, that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. And so that the more stressed and depressed the parents are, the more medication a child might need for their asthma. And why? Because the child's emotions have an impact on the child's physiology, and a parent's emotional states have an impact on the child's emotions. And if you want to look at it more broadly, what are we talking about? If you're looking at the increasing rate of asthma in North America these days, and allergies of all kinds, or the increasing rate of ADHD and depression and all that amongst kids, what's going on? What's going on is that the parents are getting more stressed, and therefore the kids are getting more stressed, and therefore the kids are getting more sick. And it's not a question of the parents not loving their kids, it's not a question of blaming parents, it's not a question of parents not doing their best. It's the question is that because of economic circumstances and greater isolation, the breakdown of extended families, the breakdown of communities, all the uncertainties of modern industrial life, the parents are more stressed, and the more stressed the parents are, the more stressed the kids are. And when the kids are emotionally stressed, that also affects their physiology. Isolation. At the end of life, a number of studies have shown now that when people are 
uh, emotionally isolated, the more likely they get sick, and if they get sick, they're more likely to die. And so, for example, amongst elderly couples, when one of them is hospitalized, the other's risk for dying goes up significantly. Why? Because our physiology cannot be separated from our emotions, and our emotions cannot be separated from our relationships. So human relationships are actually necessary to, to maintain healthy human life. We're social creatures. It also means that in a society where kids are growing up increasingly without their parents, because their parents are too busy working, they have to, and where children are more and more uh, without that support of the clan and the extended family and the community, you're going to get more people growing up in isolation. And then we try and compensate for that with our cell phones and our internet, which doesn't really do it for us, because for real intimacy, for real contact, you need human connections, not mechanical connections. And so what we're seeing is a whole set of dynamics that leave children more hurt and more isolated. As a result, there are many more problems that they try and compensate for through all kinds of behaviors. And the behaviors that lead to physical illness, like trying to be super nice and trying always to suppress yourself and taking on too much stress, and, the, and or the behaviors that try to compensate by soothing yourself through addictions, they all come down to what happened earlier in life. And I'm just writing an article right now for the Toronto Star on the recent election. And let me f finish with just one final comment. I don't care what you think about Stephen Harper's policies. This is not a political talk. But one thing I can tell you is that so many people felt uncomfortable with him on the emotional level. Why did they feel uncomfortable with him? Because they looked into his eyes, and what did they see? They saw nothing. And people talked about his dead eyes. Now, you know what that tells me? That he was a traumatized person. Because a child's eyes go dead when what they're seeing is too painful. And emotionally, the brain protects the child by shutting down emotionally. And then, when you're hurt emotionally, then one of the ways you compensate is you want to be controlling, and you want to be angry, and you want to be powerful, and you want to close your eyes to human suffering and to human vulnerability, and your eyes go dead. And that's not a deliberate decision. So here's what I'm saying to you. Whether you're looking at politics or health or human behavior, whether you're looking at education, whether you're looking at relationships, because how we program these children shows up in our adult relationships. So when I arrive from a speaking trip uh, and my wife is not there to pick me up at the airport and I have this pain and I have this anger, you know what that's about? That's about the fact that my mother abandoned me when I was a year old because to save my life she gave me to a stranger. That's how it was. And that emotional memory of abandonment is still in here and it shows up with the trivial um, trigger of my wife not being there at the airport to pick me up. So, all this stuff can be worked out, but if I can just summarize everything I've tried to tell you, the first few years are so important. And so if you have children, make those three or four or five early years the most important years of your life to devote them to your children. And if you're as an adult, are suffering from depression, anxiety, addiction, illness, or whatever, go back to your childhood and find out how you were hurt and heal that hurt, and then you can heal yourself. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed his lecture on the mind-body connection. It's very interesting, and some of the things he addresses is kind of counter to some of the psychology and mental health ideology that is present in modern day so it's really really fascinating to see him provide his insights from his medical background and his professional background if anything he says resonates with you or struck a chord please leave a comment down in the comment section below i would love to hear what your thoughts are on him thanks so much for watching